Okay, I think we'll go ahead and uh, get started then. Hello, I'm, my name is James Robson and I'm the Victor and William Fung Director of the Harvard Asia Center. And I wanted to welcome everyone to this morning's Asia Beyond the Headlines seminar series entitled Border Conflicts in the Himalayas, Bhutan, Nepal, India, and China. This event is sponsored by the Harvard University Asia Center and also co-sponsored by the Fairbanks Center for Chinese Studies, the Harvard Yenjing Institute, and the Lakshmi Mittal and Family South Asia Institute at Harvard University. We're really uh, glad to be able to uh, host this event this morning on an important issue which has a long history of some seven decades over the boundary disputes in this region, um, but has also been the focus of tension and increased violence uh, since uh, this past year in 2020. And the Asia Center um, began discussing this panel uh, last uh, fall, I think initially with Tenzin, and we're really happy that it was able uh, to be organized uh, to appear today. And I'd like to begin by thanking Tenzin Nodup, who's the program coordinator at the Harvard University Asia Center for all his efforts in bringing this together uh, today. I'd also like to thank my colleague, uh, Professor Arnab Ghosh for all of his assistance and willingness to serve as the moderator today. So I'll begin by introducing him and then he will take over as the moderator and introduce uh, the speakers this morning. So Arnab Ghosh is an associate professor of modern Chinese history in the history department at Harvard University. He's a historian of modern China with research and teaching interest in social and economic history, the history of science and statecraft, transnational history and China India history. He was trained at Haverford College and Tsinghua University as well as Columbia University. He joined the history department in 2015 from the Harvard Academy for International and Area Studies, where he was an academy scholar uh, for the 2014-2015 year. His book entitled Making It Count, Statistics and Statecraft in Early People's Republic of China uh, was published last year by Princeton University Press. And it's a fascinating and illuminating study of how the early uh, PRC state built statistical capacity to know the nation through numbers. So thank you very much for leading this discussion today. And thank you to all of our uh, speakers today for joining us uh, from all over the world, actually. So welcome to everybody. Great, thank you so much, James, you. Uh, for, for that introduction. And, and uh, I'd like to echo, echo your warm welcome to everyone, our panelists, and of course the audience uh, that is joining us. Um, and, and, and sort of recognize that uh, not only, I'm, I'm hoping the audience is, is from all over the, the world, but I want to also note that our panelists are actually also spread out from uh, all over the world. We have uh, someone from the East Coast, some from the West Coast, and then of course from different parts of South Asia in Bangalore and Colombo as well. So we have a real geographic spread in some ways. Uh, I'm gonna briefly go ahead and introduce each of our panelists at the beginning uh, so that uh, we can sort of uh, transition smoothly from one speaker to the other. Uh, and then we should have, each speaker will speak for about 12 to 15 minutes, and then we'll have hopefully about 20 to 30 minutes of time for questions and answers from the audience. And I should say that people should feel free when you're in the audience uh, to uh, type up your questions using the Q&A function, uh, do, you know, as speakers are speaking, so we can collect them and then also sort of curate them in some way so that thematically, questions that are thematically close to each other can be, can be posed together. Uh, so uh, uh, let me go ahead and, and sort of introduce each of our speakers. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, delighted uh, to welcome uh, Dr. Sudha Ramachandran, who will speak first. Uh, uh, Dr. Ramachandran is an independent analyst based in uh, Bangalore, uh, Bengaluru, India, I'm sorry. Her articles uh, have appeared uh, on, her articles on South Asian foreign policy, peace and conflict issues have appeared in The Diplomat, China Brief, uh, Terrorism Monitor, uh, World Politics Review and Asian Affairs. Uh, she has reported from and carried out research uh, in several conflict zones, including uh, Sri Lanka, Kashmir, uh, and the Maoist areas uh, in India. She is currently adjunct faculty at the Asian College of Journalism in Chennai and teaches a course on critical international issues. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran will be followed by uh, Professor Xiaoyu Ku, uh, who is an associate professor of political science at the University of Nevada, Reno, uh, he is also a public intellectuals uh, program fellow with the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations and a non-resident senior fellow with the Inter-American Dialogue in Washington, D.C. Uh, Dr. Poo received uh, his uh, PhD from Ohio State University. He has also been a postdoctoral fellow uh, in the Princeton, Harvard, China and the World Program at Princeton University and a Stanton fellow at uh, Fundação uh, Getulio Vargas uh, in Brazil. Uh, speaking after him uh, will be Dr. Frank O'Donnell, uh, a postdoctoral scholar in uh, the Rising Power Alliances Project in the Fletcher School at Tufts University. 
Uh, he's also a non-resident fellow uh, in the South Asia program at the Stimson Center. Uh, he was previously a Stanton Junior Faculty Fellow in the Belfast Center for Science and International Affairs here at Harvard. Uh, and his research specializes in South Asian deterrence and security issues. Uh, finally, and uh, with a special thanks for joining us at very short notice uh, is uh, Shubhanga Pandey, uh, who is the editor at Himal South Asian, uh, a digital publication of South Asian politics, history and culture. Uh, he has also written for other publications, including uh, the World Politics Review, London Review of Books, uh, Jacobin, and The Caravan. And, and uh, Shubhanga joins us because uh, uh, Bhaskar Koirala, who was originally supposed to be one of the panelists, unfortunately could not make it at the very last moment. So again, uh, a special thank you uh, to Shubhanga for being able to, to accommodate our request. So uh, just one final uh, sort of note or, or comment. I think uh, you know many of you have probably been to a lot of panels on, on the border conflict uh, over the past year, especially since last summer. Uh, and we are hoping that uh, in, in designing the panel the way we have, uh, we are trying to expand the conversation beyond just perspective, perspective from China and India. And so we're really delighted that we can also understand how some of this is understood from, say, uh, a Bhutanese perspective or, or a Nepalese perspective. Uh, so, uh, so this, I'm glad that uh, that you're all joining us, and I'm really looking forward to to the to the conversation. So, so uh, let's begin. Let me hand it over to Dr. Ramachandran, and uh, and then we'll take it from there. So over to you. Uh, thank you, Aruna. You know, I like explaining things uh, through using maps, and so I uh, put this together for you, for all of you. Um, now, uh, one thing we need to bear in mind when talking about China-Bhutan relations or the China-Bhutan uh, dispute is the fact that Bhutan does not have official diplomatic economic uh, ties with China. And, uh, and so you have this huge country, China, uh, you know, it, 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 tiny Bhutan has, um, yeah, the tiny Bhutan is the only neighbor which has not yet opened up uh, to having diplomatic or economic ties with uh, this uh, major power. So, yeah, so the territorial dispute itself, on the face of it, seems very simple. It involves basically, you know, uh, two pockets of territory. This is in North Central Bhutan, that is Jakarlang and Pasamlang, and the, and a, a, a pocket here, which includes the Doklam Plateau. Now, totally, this is just 764 kilometers, square kilometers of territory. And yet you find that this is among the few land border disputes that China has still not been able to settle. And uh, subsequently, we'll go into why this has remained, um, you know, such a uh, difficult conflict or a dispute to settle. So, as I said, this is the northern, in, in northern uh, Bhutan, and this is in western Bhutan. Now, since uh, last year, for the first time, China put forward a new claim. It said that Sakteng Wildlife Sanctuary. Now, this is in eastern Bhutan. As you all can see here, it's in the Trashigang district. And, uh, you know, Bhutan had uh, this, uh, uh, it was at a meeting where Bhutan had uh, applied for loans for a project in the uh, wildlife sanctuary. And uh, the Chinese uh, representative at the meeting, he uh, shot down uh, uh, Bhutan's request on the ground that this territory is disputed area and that it has been a part of the uh, ongoing boundary talks between the two uh, between the two countries. Now, uh, uh, Bhutan subsequently, uh, you know, it issued a demarche to uh, uh, the Chinese diplomat in uh, the Chinese embassy in uh, New Delhi. Uh, and China then went on to reiterate its position. It said that, that the boundary with Bhutan was yet to be demarcated. And it said that the middle, western, and eastern sectors were disputed. So if in the past, China uh, laid claim to territory in the north and to the west of Bhutan, now for the first time, it was saying that even uh, the eastern 
uh, it had it had claims even in eastern Bhutan. Now, uh, as I said, Bhutan objected to this. It said that uh, Satang uh, Wildlife Sanctuary is very much an integral and sovereign part of Bhutan, and it uh, reiterated the fact that at no point during the boundary talks had the two sides discussed this. Uh, so it completely uh, rejected the Chinese claim. Uh, now, if you look at the two countries, I mean, it's interesting. Uh, it, it is evident that this claim is a new claim on the part of China, because if you look at the package proposal that China has put forward for resolution of the border dispute, this package with, uh, proposal makes no mention of the sub 10th century. Secondly, if you look at maps, Chinese maps, they do not include, uh, they do not include uh, uh, sub 10. So, okay, so here, uh, this map, if you look at it, this is the old dispute, the Northern uh, Bhutan and in Western Bhutan. So now you have a territory in eastern Bhutan over which uh, China uh, is laying claim since uh, around June last year. Now, uh, since, okay, so, so far the two sides have tried to uh, settle this through talks. Uh, as I told you, they, they, although the two sides don't have official diplomatic relations, ministerial level talks have been taking place since 1984. 24 rounds have taken place so far. And uh, in 1996, China for the first time put forward a package proposal. Now, if you look at this package proposal, basically what China was trying to say is that it's willing to cede claims or give up its claims over the Northern territories, that is over Jakurlang and uh, Pasunlang, but in return for Bhutan recognizing Chinese claims over the uh, uh, over Doklam, okay. So this was the swap proposal or the package proposal that uh, China put forward. Now, uh, so far Bhutan has not accepted it. I'll go into that uh, in a while. Now, uh, if you look at the way uh, you know Ch China, it seems is willing to give up, uh, you know, it's willing to give up its claims in the northern uh, part of Bhutan. But clearly, given the strategic importance of Doklam, it's unwilling to cede control over that, or not cede control, or cede its claims over that. And uh, as we know, you know, uh, Doklam is in western Bhutan, and uh, uh, as you can see to, in the map on the right, it overlooks, it provides a commanding view over the Chumbi Valley, which the significance or the strategic significance of these areas, you know, if you look at the map, you see the Chumbi Valley is like a dagger pointing towards India's Siliguri Valley, the Siliguri Corridor. Now, Siliguri Corridor links the mainland India with the Northeast India. So India has always feared that if China were to, uh, you know, that if China has control over the Doklam Plateau and if it has that access to the Doklam Plateau, that would facilitate uh, uh, an attack or, uh, you know, an invasion of India through the Chumbi Valley. And uh, this, of course, would uh, enable China to cut off uh, the, the Northeast, the rest of Northeast from the rest of India. Now, uh, so this is a, uh, a strategic territory. Now, of course, now India does not control Doklam. Doklam is being administered by Bhutan. But uh, India fears that should Doklam fall into the hands of China, then, then the advantage it has currently, that is, you know, it right now it has, uh, you know, uh, 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 troops stationed in Doklam. So it fears that this advantage, it would lose this advantage to the Chinese should uh, Doklam pass into Chinese hands. 
Okay, now, uh, now Bhutan, of course, as I told you all, has not accepted uh, this package proposal. Now, should it accept this package proposal? I think actually it would, uh, as far as Bhutan is concerned, it would uh, reduce its tensions with China. It would have a settled border with China. Uh, but there are problems. One is there are domestic factors within Bhutan itself. Now, uh, you know, Doklam itself may not have strategic significance for, uh, for Bhutan. But here in a country that is largely mountainous, uh, the, uh, the Western districts are pasture lands. So it provides livelihood uh, for these pastoralists. So it fears that it will uh, lose, uh, lead to a loss of uh, livelihoods. Also, uh, there is some opposition from at home from uh, elected representatives from the Har district. Uh, also, the most important uh, reason, of course, is that this dispute it has gotten entangled in India-China relations. And uh, so Bhutan, uh, Bhutan does not want to antagonize India. Now, as you all know that, uh, you know, there is a treaty between the two countries under which uh, the two countries, uh, you know, in uh, uh, the 1949 treaty, of course, under that treaty, uh, Bhutan was required to be guided by India in its uh, conduct of external relations. But since 2007, uh, you know, this sort of consultation is not required. Although, uh, you know, uh, the two countries, uh, if territory, Bhutanese territory, is used for activities harmful to the national security of India, uh, then this would be a matter of concern. And uh, the unspoken agreement is, of course, that India would uh, would uh, uh, could use its troops uh, to safeguard its own uh, national security interests. So, uh, for this reason, I mean, India, uh, because of this special relationship between the two countries, uh, Bhutan. Um, has not really gone ahead and established relations with China or accepted this uh, package proposal. Importantly, uh, Bhutan is dependent on India. It is a landlocked country and about 90% of its trade is conducted either with India or through India. India is a major foreign aid uh, donor. Uh, uh, it has in fact uh, financed Bhutan's uh, idea plans, a major a developer of uh, infrastructure and so on. Uh, and so because of this dependence, uh, Chai, uh, Bhutan fears uh, that India would use its uh, position to and clout to, uh, you know, to, to apply pressure on Bhutan should it defy India and, uh, you know, uh, accept a proposal that uh, that undermines India's security interests. Now, uh, as I told you all, uh, China recently uh, escalated its claims over Bhutanese territory uh, when it, uh, in June, for the first time, it, uh, it named the Sakteng Wildlife Sanctuary. And if you look at the map, you can see that this is in Eastern Bhutan here. Now, uh, why did China, why is it now claiming Sakteng when it hasn't done so in the past? I think if we look at the timing of China's claims, and also if we look at the map, the geographic location of, uh, uh, of Sakteng, a lot becomes apparent. Uh, you know, it provides us insights into uh, China's motivations. So uh, one, of course, was, you know, you must bear in mind that uh, in 2020, and especially in June, uh, the, the tensions between India and China were escalating at this point. And uh, at this, uh, you know, uh, at this point, you know, it, it is possible that China was trying to deflect Delhi's attention away from Ladakh put pressure on India on another sector 
by stepping up pressure through its claim on subtech. But, uh, you know, I think there are other more important, more medium term and long term considerations that China has. Uh, it's very likely that China has, uh, you know, laid claim to Sartek in the hope that, it, that, that, that this could be pressure on Bhutan itself. That is, it wants Bhutan to accept Doklam, uh, its claims over Doklam, and so it is putting pressure on multiple sectors so that Bhutan gives in. Uh, I would think that there's yet another factor that we must consider, and that is China is eyeing Arunachal Pradesh, that is the eastern sector, where it lays claim to about, where China lays claim to about 90,000 square kilometers of territory. Now, if you look at this map, uh, Sarteng, or this, you know, it's abuts, uh, you know, to uh, uh, the, the Arunachal Pradesh, it abuts um, Tawang which is a major bone of contention. Now, uh, in fact, I would say that that is the real price that China is eyeing in the Eastern sector. So, uh, so it, is, it is possible that China is laying claim to this area to put pressure on India. Now, according to Indian media reports, India is, uh, has apparently asked Bhutan for, uh, you know, it has plans to, uh, uh, to construct a road from Guwahati in Assam to Tawang. Now, this, of course, is part of its efforts to, uh, to build infrastructure. It's building roads uh, and other infrastructure in the Northeast to uh, support its troops along, uh, you know, the line of actual control here. So among these plans is a plan to uh, construct a road from Guwahati to Tawang, which will run through Rashiga. Now, Bhutan has not yet given its consent to such a road. Uh, this road is likely to cut travel distance by about 100, 150 kilometers and travel time here by at least five hours. So Indian troops would be able to mobilize to Tawang much faster should this road be built through uh, Trashigam or the Sakhteng Wildlife Sanctuary. Uh, analysts in India uh, believe that uh, it's, it's possible that China is trying to preempt India's construction of a road here and so is laying claim to this territory. So, um, as we stand now, and you know, uh, uh, I think about a uh, couple of weeks back, uh, China and Bhutan, uh, they agreed to hold another round of talks. Now, the 25th round of talks hasn't take pl taken place for several years, and uh, it was delayed uh, because of the Doklam crisis. So now they have agreed to hold their next round. Uh, I think, um, you know, they haven't yet agreed on the date, so we don't know when it's going to happen. But it's, uh, you know, one wonders whether China is going to reiterate uh, its claim over Sakteng at this, uh, at this meeting. If it does so, uh, you know, it would be the first time that it's actually raising it at the ministerial level, and that's serious. Um, also, I think another thing we need to watch is what is going to happen in the coming years. Now, it's not going to happen immediately, of course, but China has been pressuring uh, Bhutan to open, open up to establish formal, official diplomatic and economic ties. And uh, India reportedly is uh, standing in the way of uh, Bhutan opening up these relations. Uh, you know, uh, I think that sometimes, you know, given the fact that Bhutan is a sovereign state uh, and is a democratic country, there are increasingly, you know, the, the growing demand among a small but increasingly vocal section of uh, Bhutanese youth who want their country to be a fully sovereign country, to function as a sovereign country. And as part of this, they would like to see their country establish diplomatic and economic ties. 
so there's a lot of uh, a small pressure, but I think significant pressure building up within uh, Bhutan itself. We'll have to watch how Delhi is going to respond to this. Uh, Delhi, India, I think, needs to tread very carefully. Uh, things are changing in Bhutan. Uh, you know, while the older generation is still very, uh, you know, uh, still follows the king, still has great respect for his decisions and for his closeness to India, the younger generation, uh, you know, you have increasing activism uh, over, you know, about uh, different projects that India has undertaken and so on. So India will really have to, uh, you know, uh, change its approach towards Bhutan. Even, I would say that even China needs to be careful in its dealing with uh, uh, Bhutan in the sense that Bhutan is now watching Tibet. And how China treats Tibet is going to be very important in how Bhutan's relationship with China evolves. Now, we must bear in mind that in the 1950s and 60s, uh, you know, the flight of the Dalai Lama uh, the, uh, the brutal suppression of Tibetans, their Tibetan aspirations and so on, it had tremendous impact on the Bhutanese people uh, who share, you know, a lot of uh, cultural and other ties with the Tibetans. And they feared that, uh, uh, you know, this would be the fate of Bhutan too. And that pulled, that played an important role in Bhutan turning to India in the 50s and 60s. Now, again, if China were to make the big mistake of unleashing repression in Tibet or not recognizing uh, the, the next Dalai Lama, uh, then it, it just may uh, result in uh, the Bhutanese uh, having second thoughts about wanting better relations with China. Great. Thank, thank you so much for, for a fascinating set of reflections. And, uh, you know, we've already, questions have begun to come in in some way. So hopefully we'll have the chance to, to, to get to them. Uh, but let me, let me ask uh, Professor, Professor Xiaoyu Pu to, uh, to offer his comments now. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you uh, for inviting me. I'm, I'm, it's my great pleasure to join the conversation. Uh, regarding the border disputes, uh, I want to sort of like... Uh, uh, put this uh, topic in a broader context of uh, China-Indian relations. Uh, I, I want to uh, make some uh, sort of uh, broader observations. Uh, as a, a scholar of international security, international relations, I often think like a lot of security challenges, uh, there is no perfect solution. So normally there are bad situation, worst situation or catastrophe situation. The real challenge is how we avoid catastrophe. And it's not like a find a perfect solution. Everybody's happy. I mean, there's no such a thing in international security issues. So re regarding that, the border dispute between India and China on the one hand, it was very tragic last year. I mean, both sides, casualty occurred. I mean, it ha ha did not happen before, uh, at, at, at least for, for, for several decades. So it was very uh, uh, tragic. But on the other hand, think about two nuclear powers with huge population, strong militaries. They could still manage to some degree th this uh, uh, severe tensions. So th th there's are some good wisdoms from both sides, although, I mean, there are urgent needs for us to reflect how to manage this tension going forward. So regarding that, I wanna offer three sort of a broader framework to understand the issues. Uh, one is security dynamic, that's the traditional uh, perspective from, from IR, international relations, uh, a perspective. The other is I, I conceptualize as status dynamic. Uh, the third is a symmetry of power and attention. So these three framework to help us understand the tension, especially regarding the border dispute and also uh, China-Indian relations. The first, security dynamic. Uh, it refers to a situation where even nation states, this largely defensive purpose, 
they could still entrapped into tension or even conflicts because one country want to increase their either the military capabilities or, 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 or their uh, sort of their their military uh, uh, sort of deterrence. Other view that action as a threat. So then two countries could entrap into, into uh, co confrontation or conflict. So we may see some uh, indicators regarding China-Indian relations or the border disputes, whether China is building infrastructure near the border or India is developing their infrastructure, all both sides, they adjust their tactics near the border. I mean, each side see those moves as sort of a offensive strategy, but from their own perspective, they see the, these uh, tactics or infrastructure building as, as defensive. So in a, in a broader sense, of course, uh, uh, China worried that India might strengthen its military cooperation with the United States as a, as a balance versus China. And India traditionally worry China's strategic or military cooperation with Pakistan. So there's some sort of balance of power politics related to this uh, security dynamic uh, framework. So this is the first uh, uh, perspective. The second is uh, status dynamic. Uh, what, what is this? This assumes that the, the major issue is not a sort of the traditional security or military security itself is more of a status concerns from both sides. So status dynamic describes a situation that actually each side also has defensive purpose regarding their status, but each side feels the other's action might threaten their own sense of status uh, on, the, on the international stage. From Indian's perspective, particular, uh, Indian worry that China might constrain Indian's influence regionally and globally regarding either the nuclear supply group uh, or uh, United Nations Security Council uh, uh, membership uh, uh, and also regional influence. When China, uh, whenever China tries to develop relationship with other South Asian countries, India feels that might threaten India's sort of traditional leadership or power and influence in the region. So those kind of dynamics also add to these kind of border disputes. So we, we, we see vividly demonstrated through China-Budan dynamics, right? So it, it, regarding that particular issue, it, it was not a, a direct dispute between China versus India. It's actually direct border dispute between China-Budan. But the, India has traditionally sort of a relationship with Budan. So that, there, there, that's one example. Another example I actually uh, I, I watched the news maybe yesterday. Uh, uh, Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi hosted uh, sort of like a phone call with some of the South Asian countries, and India was not uh, was was not participating. So people might wonder why. So that's I, I think uh, uh, the, the dynamics as I describes. India may fear whenever China is developing. Uh, its influence or diplomatic or political ties with other South Asian countries, India may feel that threaten its traditional power and influence in the region. So that's sort of like status concerns for the uh, for both countries. The third uh, uh, th uh, framework I want to highlight is this kind of asymmetric of power and attention. So. What does this mean? India largely views China as a major threat, uh, given all these dis uh, different issues, uh, given the, 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 the gap of power between the two countries. But China does not view India as a major threat. To some degree, China does not pay enough attention to India. 
to, 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 to some degree. So then we, we see sometimes maybe uh, Indian people, maybe elites, policymakers worry China might be actively containing Indians rise regionally or globally. But the real, sometimes the real problem is maybe Chinese elites are not or do not uh, pay enough attention or do not have demonstrate enough sensitivity of some of the issues between the two countries. So uh, uh, regarding the border disputes, uh, Indians perspective is, it's, this is a, such a crucial issue. It's so important. Uh, we must uh, handle this issue, maybe resolve this issue peacefully so the relationship could move forward. But for a lot of Chinese policymakers, they think that this could be reversed in a sense that border dispute is important, but not that important. So if China and India could uh, move their relationship forward, then they could resolve the border dispute. So the, in a sense that border dispute is that or, or relationship, wh wh which is uh, should be uh, given priority. So there are different uh, kinds of perceptions and different kinds of attention uh, be between the uh, between the two countries. And and, uh, and uh, so. Uh, Actually, a few days ago, I, I had some exchange with a uh, with a Chinese professor. Uh, he's a very famous sort of political scientist uh, professor. Uh, uh, although he, he he does not uh, like uh, research entirely on focus on China Indian issues, but but he largely think that okay, China should really pursue a more friendly policy versus India. China should in the long term uh, invite or, or at least accept India's join of the United Nations Security Council and, 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 and other, other issues. I think, oh, that's a pretty bold sort of uh, proposal. But this professor also said, oh, the border dispute, it's not a big issue. I mean, it, it could be resolved uh, um, maybe in the future easily. So that, at that point, I, I realized from this Chinese professor, although his overall pr uh, proposal or attitude was very uh, friendly toward India, but he did not recognize the sensitivity uh, of this issue, especially from India's perspective, given the border war in 1962, given this uh, continued shape Indian's politics, uh, even nationalism. And so, so, but I, I, I clearly feel there's a sort of a symmetry of attention regarding this issue between the two countries. Okay, let me summarize, uh, uh, have uh, some final thoughts. The, uh, number one, I think the border disputes, given, uh, given uh, uh, is related to nationalism, identity, and many other factors, it is so difficult, it's not easy. So in the, in the near future, the, the best outcome is to avoid the worst or the catastrophe outcome. Uh, it's not easy to, to handle it e easily. Uh, second, in the short term, I don't worry like the two countries could really get into like a, uh, like a military confrontation. Uh, uh, I think that will be irrational or, or too costly for both sides. But even there, there is a less chance of direct military confrontation. What I worry me is, I, I, I think the securitization of the relationship in a sense that even uh, maybe there is less chance China and India will directly engage in military confrontation over the border. But given the border disputes, both sides uh, worry about each other. Then, then we see a lot of like a normal sort of economic, social, even educational exchanges could become problems in the future. I think that's that that's the real issue. Uh, uh, let me stop there. Thank you. Thank you so much, Xiaoyu, for those uh, very thoughtful comments. <clears throat> and in some ways, you ended on a note that reminds one of 
sort of the kind of mini Cold War that took uh, that took place after 62. And it wasn't until the late 80s that sort of uh, connections, not just political, but all other kinds of connections are sort of reestablished. So I think that's a really important reminder. So let's uh, thank you again. So let's turn now to uh, uh, Dr. Frank O'Donnell for his, uh, his thoughts. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the organizers, James Robson and Tenson Noda for inviting me, to yourself, Hannah Rob Ghosh for moderating this excellent panel. Uh, and so with my time, I'll aim to address four broad questions. These are, one, what's prompted the recent incidents of conflict in the India-China border areas? Two, what are the relative strengths of air, ground, and nuclear forces of India and China in the region? Uh, three, how the strategic competition between India and China impacts the security of Bhutan and Nepal. And lastly, what are the prospects of India and China collaborating to bring lasting stability to the region? Uh, so I'll touch on each of these with, with the time I have, but um, of course, there's probably more we can get into in each topic in the Q&A. Firstly, on the causes of the recent incidents of conflict in the India-China border areas, I think, to paraphrase strategic expert Srinath Raghavan, this reflects a deteriorating confidence in both New Delhi and Beijing that they can peacefully resolve the outstanding disputed areas along their Himalayan land border. And so there have been longstanding mutual commitments to compartmentalize the border issue and not allow it to hinder economic and other political cooperation between New Delhi and Beijing. But it's becoming increasingly evident that this is no longer possible, as we saw in the unprecedented fierce public rhetoric during the Doklam crisis of summer 2017, in which both sides made barely veiled threats of war against each other, and now in the Ladakh crisis starting in spring 2020, and which is still ongoing, where China and India have incurred their first fatalities suffered by military personnel in their border regions in decades. China and latterly India since the start of the 2020 crisis simply believe that peaceful negotiation of the border will only be used by the other side as surface cover to build up more forces in the disputed areas. And it seems that both are simply now focusing on establishing facts on the ground in the disputed areas through increasing their military presence there. The second point I want to make here is that this is not solely, these dynamics are not solely a China-India phenomenon, uh, but as the other panelists might also attest, part of a trend of Chinese aggression and assertion toward its neighbors. There have been some accounts of the India-China conflict in 2020 that have pointed out kind of as a cause of all this, as a cause of the 2020 crisis, the negative views in Beijing of India formally incorporating its disputed area of Kashmir, which was formally under its de facto governance legally into the Indian Union in late October, 2019. And another part of this account is the, the fact that the Indian Home Minister Ahmed Shah uh, renewed India's claim in Parliament in, in August 2019 uh, to the entire uh, the, to the entirety of Kashmir, including the northeastern Trans Karakoram Tract and Aksai Chin areas, which are de facto governed by China. And so, and that this Indian combination of legal changes, reassertion of broader border claims, and gradually military buildup near border areas that forced China's hand to compel it to back off. Uh, by militarily intervening. And so there is something to that argument, but I think we also need to consider what was happening more broadly for China at the time. Xi Jinping's domestic and foreign policies have never been as popular within the CCP as they're often portrayed in the West. And in spring 2020, he was coming out of the worst of the COVID crisis within China and needed to really provide a show of strength to both domestic and foreign critics that he and China under his leadership were back on top. So the Chinese military incursions into Ladakh in spring 2020 coincided at the same time with more aggressive naval activities against Vietnam and the Philippines and more frequent air force sorties into Taiwanese airspace. And so I imagine the level of trust among Chinese neighbors that Xi is interested in peacefully negotiating any of China's border disputes must be minimal at this time. Moving now to the second point on the relative strengths of India and China in air, land, and nuclear forces on the Himalayan borders. 
This draws from a study that I conducted with my colleague, Alexandra Bullfrass, and which, which was published by the Belfast Center last year, and which is available on their website. And they aim to analyze um, just the, the comparative strengths of um, what India and China had in terms of major ground and air combat platforms facing each other across the Himalayas from the relative theater commands, as well as nuclear forces. What we found is that India's forces are, perm the, the, firstly, that they're, they are actually roughly equivalent in terms of the forces at their disposal and the relevant theater commands facing each other. However, India's forces are permanently stationed in greater numbers closer to the border areas than China's. China's are stationed geographically further into their interior. And so this creates a natural inbuilt advantage for India in that in the event of, the, of a major crisis, by having your permanent forces located closer, you're able to mobilize them more quickly and get them to the disputed area more quickly. Whereas for China to do the same, because they're located further back, there's a longer lead time. And even with arguments that China has superior road, rail, so on, the amount of simply noise that this would generate for intelligence uh, would alert India or also alert the US with which we know has an intelligence relationship with India. And so we concluded that India does have certain inbuilt advantages uh, against China in conventional terms. In, in nuclear terms, China, of course, still has a, a much more superior nuclear arsenal to, to India. Um, however, you know, the main, uh, reflecting what um, Jayu just said, you know, it's, it's, it's remote to consider nuclear use of India against China or vice versa. Um, and, it's, and even with regard to conventional warfare of those major platforms, that's, it's still more likely, but I still think fairly remote. Even in those circumstances, the only kind of loophole that Chinese military forces could, uh, could get out of this trap, so to speak, or to, uh, to get out of this disadvantage, in terms of making a major military move against India, the only loophole we uh, identified was for the forces to simply to invade intelligence detection by India. We at the time concluded that that risk was minimal due to the reasons I talked about in terms of you know, constantly improving Indian intelligence surveillance capabilities, as well as the US relationship to alert India in case China is doing anything uh, that it should be warned about. Um, we concluded that, that for those reasons, that risk was minimal. We did not factor in that um, the Indian political leadership would be informed of what was going on, as we're finding out with regard to spring, summer 2020, but that they would, that, but that they would be as dovish in the early stages of the Chinese incursions as they were. Uh, even after the events of May 5, 2020, in which Indian forces were outnumbered and beaten up by Chinese forces uh, in Indian Indian, Indian governed Ladakh, uh, Prime Minister Modi and National Security Advisor Ajit Doval, the key Indian decision makers still believed, even after this, that this would only be a repeat of something similar to the 2013 Chinese Depsang incursion, in which Chinese forces intruded into only one of the same areas as a 2020 incursion. However, in 2013, they simply camped out there for three weeks and withdrew. And India's key decision makers didn't recognize, or I think more likely didn't want to recognize for just the political cost of this, that 2020 was very different. And they waited until very late in the day to treat it as something that was very different. Thirdly now, on the impacts of all this on the smaller, but still very strategically important Himalayan states of Nepal and Bhutan, uh, these states do face increasing difficulties in terms of maintaining I think effective independence from both China and also India. And the most obvious way I think to navigate this and to the extent possible is to simply to play India and China off each other, which we have seen more successfully deployed by Sri Lanka and the Maldives regarding, for example, getting India and China to compete to be the major infrastructure investor for those states. Another possibility for Nepal and Bhutan is to look slightly north to the Central Asian states, who have also similarly struggled to maintain their post-Cold War independence um, against the challenges of being stuck between two similar giants this time, Russia and China. And these Central Asian states have gained more leverage uh, by directly engaging outside powers to balance Russia and China, such as the US and EU. 
And so I think I think there's little to lose, and there's little um, little harm that could be, that could be done by greater diplomatic outreach by Nepal and Bhutan uh, to the U.S., to the EU, and even Russia, in the interest of protecting their ultimate foreign policy, independent sovereignty, these small states uh, against both India and China, and that this may be a way forward. And lastly, uh, against this fairly, I think, grim backdrop. What are the prospects of India and China collaborating to bring lasting peace and stability to the region? Uh, my, my assessment, my answer is it's, it's very minimal and that their, their mutual interest in real collaboration or definitely when it comes to security issues is very low. I think that Nepal and Bhutan should, as I say, intensify engagement of all major powers, especially those outside the region. Uh, they should aim, you know, to as far as possible, play them off against each other while committing to none in terms of signing exclusive pacts and alliances, as this gives each major power a greater stake in the stability of Nepal and Bhutan, as well as regional stability. And in a way, this, this kind of multi-alignment is something that India itself has done very well. Um, for example, despite these, these border disputes with China, India is still engaging China. India is still hosting the BRICS summit this year, to which, of which China is a part and which it is invited, and still engaging China through the Russia-India-China trilateral alignment and the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Uh, so with that, I'll conclude. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Frank. Uh, we are, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if others are watching, but there's so many questions coming in. As you can see, people are responding uh, in real time to what people are saying. So it's actually quite fascinating and hopefully we'll get to some of them. But thank you so much for laying it out uh, in such clear terms, though in, I would say, uh, fairly grim terms, <laughs> as far as the prospects are concerned. So finally, uh, let, let's turn to uh, Shubhanga Pandey. I just want to add a quick uh, note for those of us who joined late. Uh, Bhaskar Koirala, who was on the poster and on the original program, was unable to join us uh, at the last minute, and Shabhaga Pandey is joining us, um, and we're grateful that he can he can offer some of his thoughts. Uh, so over to you, Shabhaga. Uh, thanks, Arnab, and uh, thanks for having me on this really fascinating panel. Um, um, I I'll begin by saying that uh, since I don't have a presentation, and um, so I apologize in advance for uh, you know if my observations seem a bit scattered, but uh, um, but I'll begin. So I was actually, uh, you know, thinking, you know, also looking at the 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 kind of the subtitle of the of the event, which is beyond the headlines, and kind of got me thinking. I mean, there are interesting headlines that are actually within, you know, in domestic public sphere of these countries that actually don't make it to the international headlines because all of us. Our, our mediation to what's happening in these countries is, you know, mostly based on reading English language reporting. Um, so I thought it might be interesting to look at the look at how uh, the Nepali public sphere is kind of talking about the border conflict and the larger kind of geopolitical questions that, you know, particularly uh, in the context of Nepal, given the the border contestation with India in in the summer of 2020 uh, in the Western Himalayan uh, area of Lipu Lake. So. Um, and uh, I mean, the other rationale for doing this was also that um, if you follow Nepali politics at all, you will be, you know, you'll encounter this endless array of kind of divisions of parties, especially the communist parties that is, you know, always on the verge of another split. Um, or you'll read Nepal as part of a larger kind of geopolitical power play, right? And 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 what cards it plays and all of that. So. Um, so to extract what's happening at the domestic level kind of gets difficult because you, you don't really get the, the data from the ground that way. Um, and all of it can be kind of obscured by uh, kind of a meta narrative. So so I'll, I'll, I'll basically look at that. And the other reason is also because a lot of, I think, scholarship, um, foreign policy related scholarship, when it relates to Nepal, is kind of entirely based on media reporting. Um, so, you know, eventually the, the public sphere kind of makes an impact in scholarship also, not just domestic politics, but also kind of international um, understanding of what's going on. Um, so, and the larger argument I'm kind of thinking is there has been a substantial change in the kind tone and the, let's say the primary concerns of the Nepali public sphere. Um, and it's useful to think of it as two different phases. Um, so it's gone from what one might say a public sphere that was largely interested in domestic questions of federalism, identity politics, um, you know, 
peacekeeping, um, basically the, the new Nepal, that was the big uh, sort of agenda after the end of the, of the conflict. Um, from that phase, we've kind of, and this kind of aligns with the new constitution, but also greater, I think, geopolitical kind of frequency of geopolitical episodes. Um, maybe the last five years have been more about, um, you know, the big, uh, big foreign policy questions, uh, where Nepal stands, um, what kinds of intrusion are we seeing in our uh, body politic from, from foreign um, capitals and all of that. So um, if we can, um, so, so, and I'll say that the transformation has been from, let's say, uh, a public sphere interested in kind of progressive questions to one that is largely narrowly defined um, by national interest and and uh, and is more nationalist in tone. Um, so I, I'll start by talking about the first phase. Let's see if we can call it that uh, from around 2006 to 2015. So these would be the years between um, the end of the conflict and there was a comprehensive peace agreement between um, the democratic political parties and the Maoists. Um, the agreement itself happened in India, which is also an important point uh, on how that factor comes into play. But at any rate, so that's where it kind of begins. And for the next you know, nine, 10 years until the constitution was kind of promulgated, um, the, you know, the major questions were about, should Nepal be a federal nation? Um, what role do different uh, ethnic groups have in this new federation of, uh, of, of uh, you know, is it a multinational country? Uh, uh, or uh, are we to think about it as a more centralized polity? Um, should we be secular or not? What are the kinds of demands for secularism? Um, what is the nature of devolution of, of power in federalism? Um, and, and also, it's a conversation largely dominated by sociologists, anthropologists, historians, people in traditional kind of academia. Uh, one could say largely sympathetic to the kinds of changes Nepal seemed poised for. You know, after say 200 years of, of monarchy and, and uh, long periods of of, um, uh, of without democracy, um, so and it 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 kind of also the international interest at that time was also again largely based on post conflict kind of nation building um, that was kind of uh, combined with questions about okay w what are the kinds of experiences of indigenous groups over the last several years and how do we correct for that you know so it, it was a, 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 a a big collection of kind of social questions and policy questions and how do we figure that out um and it ended with the let's say the constitution promulgation in 2015 uh, which also happened very uh, few months after the earthquake so you know the earthquake was kind of a jolt to the body politic and to the to the three major parties kind of driving all of this process um and it ended with the constitution which of course we all know um, had a lot of uh, a lot of groups, uh, political groups, and communities in Nepal's south had serious objections with the constitution and also with the way uh, some of the states were demarcated. Uh, and so there was a blockade that those protesters imposed, which was also supported by the Indian state. So we had about six or seven months long period of blockade um, uh, of of uh, largely petroleum products, but other things also that that uh, Nepal relies uh, uh, from India. And I mean, that was a real, um, I think that was kind of a point when the, the public sphere also kind of got transformed. Um, obviously, around that time, there was a lot more interest in Indian interference, not just uh, with the blockade, which kind of symbolized a lot of things, but also over the years, beginning with the fact that, you know, the, the entire agreement when the war happened in New Delhi, um, some of the Maoist leaders were um, staying in parts of India during this period of conflict. Um, so they, so even if the Indian state did not support them, they were not, uh, you know, deported, let's say. Um, and, uh, then there was also the question of changes in, 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 uh, the structure of the Nepali state. So the creation of federal state, uh, the decision to be a secular nation, um, and to be a Republic, all three, which were largely driven by domestic, uh, kind of political compunction and narratives started to get kind of reframed around that time as being largely either Indian or European or, you know, even if it was generated in Nepal, it was based on programs and studies and ideas that were borrowed from the outside world. So um, it, it there was kind of a flipping of, of the priorities and the kind of conversations you were having in between that time from 2015 to, let's say, 2020, 2021. Um, 
of course the in in 2020 uh, may um, after the indian government opened up a, a link road uh, in western himalaya which is a area called lipu lake which the nepali state also uh, claims uh, th that it's its territory so that really was another major flashpoint in the you know in in recent nepal india history so that kicked off a lot of confrontation um it in some ways it began in 2019 november after uh, indian government put out a new political map which included that same area um and that kind of made news in nepal because uh, that was seen as a kind of uh, you know uh, basically a cartographic aggression of a kind um what was missed by the public sphere was of course that India had used the same political map since at least the 1960s. Uh, um, and the colonial government since 1870s had used the same map. But I think because it came at a time when, um, you know, the Section 370 was abrogated and, and it, there was a, a kind of larger narrative um, about uh, growing Indian interference in all kinds of um, the word of choices, micromanagement in Nepali affairs. Um, so I think you know, it, it was a coming together of these uh, several factors. And um, and I think what we really saw in this new phase of uh, uh, of change was that instead of, let's say, social scientists or um, people in traditional academia or people sympathetic to certain kind of, let's say, left liberal politics, uh, that was largely replaced by people um, more interested in kind of power strategies, um, People usually either retired civil servants, um, some scholars in think tanks, um, you know, uh, people who have made um, YouTube polemics kind of their main style. Um, they are the people invited to write for newspapers suddenly. So th there's a, a transformation in the tone also of the conversations we're having. And uh, it's uh, it also includes, interestingly, not just the people who are not um, who are traditional right-wing uh, kind of commentators and writers, so people you might associate with uh, with the monarchy or, or people who are uh, slanted towards you know, the military, but also actually, interestingly, former communists um, who might still call themselves communists, but are actually quite adept at using uh, kind of the communist vocabulary for largely conservative positions to stake out, you know, um, to kind of so you will see examples of uh, of long time communists kind of arguing why nepal should remain a hindu nation for example so those are so frequent in occurrence and and i mean one point to be made is that um you know that was the other large conversation that nepal now has a a government run by uh, a communist party which is actually a a, 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 a combined party which uh, was formed after the merger of a you know leninist marxist party and a, a maoist party um and a lot of international coverage, but also domestic coverage kind of fixates on the fact that it's a, a, a largely communist run state, which is, if you do a sober analysis of their politics over the last 10, 15 years, it's, it becomes clear they're more of a new conservative party than a communist party per se, um, who have revised their position in light of what they see is a kind of a new political reality. And, uh, and, and, and then kind of, kind of, um, a realistic or, or, or uh, kind of cold understanding of the global priority is, is a is a big factor in how they frame that uh, uh, how they frame their new position, right? So, um, so I think there's an interesting parallel also in kind of the transformation of the political elite or the kinds of rhetoric it employs and the kinds of people you see in the public sphere, the kind of writings you see. Um, so. That has been the transformation. Now, if you look at some specific cases of how the border conflict played out in the Nepali media um, and among the folks and uh, you know writers and commentators in the Nepali public sphere, it was, I mean, the one clear um, case was that there, there's clearly a diminution of of Indian uh, the credibility of uh, Indian soft power, for example. It no longer, and it used to for you know for let's say six seven decades had. A, had a big presence, uh, especially the uh, kind of um, left liberal establishment in India was seen uh, by the kind of democratic forces in Nepal as an uh, 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 a source of, of, if not inspiration, but of you know some kind of support and solidarity that no longer exists anymore, uh, largely because of of how the Indian media covered it, including. Uh, you know, it wasn't just the right-wing Indian media that covered it in a very kind of uh, nationalist and uh, slightly paranoid sense. It also included 
publications you would consider slightly more sober. So I think that there was that reappraisal of of, um, of what the Indian public sphere meant for Nepali public sphere people. Um, and um, I think it was also seen largely as a, a disturbance of status quo uh, by the Indian state because it was a disputed region. Uh, and interestingly, the same, um, if you look at the coverage of Chinese involvement in Nepal, uh, it's given a slight benefit of doubt, which is not a new phenomenon. Um, there's a well-known scholar of Nepali international relations and Himalayan studies, Leo Rose, who describes in 1970 the, the same kind of benefit of doubt extended to China back then also. You know, you see uh, uh, now it's not just India, but also kind of the West um, uh, seen as being in some ways of existential threat to what it means to be a Nepali state, you know, questions of religion, um, minority rights and all of that. Um, the Chinese intrusion is seen more as a, you know, straightforward business transaction. Uh, again, as uh, seen from a kind of uh, perspective of a realism uh, in IR. So it's it's uh, it's given, um, I think the word micromanagement, which I mentioned before, the, the kind of um, uh, Indian states efforts to kind of uh, play with how Nepali parties uh, decide their, their uh, priorities, that I think has been seen in some Chinese involvement in recent years. So that's the extent to which uh, Nepali critique goes. And there are some uh, in the English language media and uh, uh, who are not too influential in kind of critiquing Chinese involvement and what it might mean for Nepali democracy and Nepali kind of civil society and how it might impact that. But um, it, it's it's largely not influential because it doesn't really get picked up in the in the vernacular uh, media. Um, so basically, you're seeing this kind of emergence of what you might call a new conservative civil society with the uh, Kind of the old traditional civil society in rather defensive mood um and uh, it probably will i don't see it changing so much in the near future um but just to kind of to conclude what we might expect in the coming days um the kind of stories we might uh, expect to see the kind of reporting from nepal uh i think we don't see it yet but we might see greater kind of polar polarization um Kind of paralleling the geopolitical coverage of of, um, of China and U.S. and India, um, for example, the debate on what happens to Millennium um, uh, Challenge Corporation, the MCC, was quite big and inflated in Nepal. Um, interestingly, after the the whole thing had been signed, because you know about a year or two after it had been signed, that the debate was so big. So the influence has also worked that way, and largely because I think the debate became big in, in Sri Lanka. Um, so uh, the priorities are also kind of sometimes affected by kind of this global conversation about great power game and all of that. So uh, there is a likelihood you might see more um, analysts, um, scholars, um, again, people who largely work with, with foreign policy as their main area of interest kind of also be split along those lines. Um, it's a bit more difficult for the uh, the traditional civil society that I was talking about, the kind of standard left liberal civil society. They will be increasingly, I think, irrelevant because it's also quite challenging for them to stake out a position in this game because, you know, you can't critique. I mean, th there are limits to how you can critique uh, Chinese presence without appearing too pro-US. They're already uh, accused of being very pro-West because some of them are involved in NGOs that might get support from the West. And, you know, there's a larger ecology of nonprofit system and how that works out. Uh, but I think what you're seeing is a steady displacement of that older community of, of analysts and writers and speakers um, and kind of a, a coalition of a traditional kind of right-wing analysts and writers and also kind of emerging new uh, Kind of polemicists who are making um, who are starting to make waves in Nepal. So uh, I think I I think I'll end there. Sri Banga, thank you so much for those reflections uh, on on how sort of the the domestic politics have been changing so dramatically in the past I guess decade and a half. Um, so we uh, we have about twenty minutes formally. Uh, we have a lot of questions that have come in already, and I've been trying to sort of curate them as best as possible. And I have already. Uh, what I'm hoping will be at least two rounds uh, of questions, and then we'll see if more come in, and I'll try and keep keep uh, curating them. So, uh, what I'm what I suggest, in the interest of time and in the interest of trying to at least cover as large um, a sort of spread of the questions that have come in, I'm going to ask the questions all together. I'm going to ask sort of 
three sets of questions, uh, sort of combining uh, a few questions that have come in. Uh, and hopefully, as you'll see, these three, uh, these three sets of questions will hopefully address each of our panelists in different ways. And then we'll have a set of responses from our panelists, and then we'll try and do a second round, uh, depending on how we're doing with time. So if, uh, if you, your question is slated for the second round and we're running out of time, I apologize in advance, uh, but we'll try and do the best we can. So the first question that I want to draw, uh, I want to raise uh, has come, is, is sort of about uh, sort of Bhutan and India. This is from an anonymous attendee. Um, if, uh, for the panelists, if they're able to read, it's timestamped 9.24 a.m. Uh, from my discussions with Bhutanese diplomats, I have understood that, there are, that they are really not concerned about any border disputes, particularly this new one in Sakhtan. The Indian authorities have immense sway over Bhutanese, Bhutan's internal and international politics. Is it possible that India is really behind this drama and it is another way to make China a paper tiger and consolidate domestic support for Modi? So this is clearly for, for you, Dr. Uh, Ramachandran. So that's one, one question. There, there are two questions in, in the second set. These are, again, for the panelists. I'm stamped at 9.41 and 9.45. Uh, the, the, there's a question from an anonymous attendee who says, in the three perspectives given by Professor Xiaoyu Pu, the reasons for India-China dispute have largely been presented as a result of India's paranoia. But what if it is viewed as being similar to Chinese military aggression elsewhere, like in the South China Sea? Uh, and linked to that is a question from uh, Gopal Nadadur, who asks, uh, if history is our guide, Rising world powers also expect demand increasing influence and hegemony over their neighbors for a number of reasons. Uh, so should we really expect China to be any different in this regard? Or is it sort of filling a, a, I guess, a pattern that we know from, from past experience? Um, and the third set of questions has to deal with, uh, in some ways, the India-Nepal connection and India's paranoia and the changing sort of responses in Nepal. So the first question in that connection is from uh, Tarun Simalsina, who asks, this is 949, how much is Indian hegemony in South Asia over the years responsible for the current pivot towards China that we are seeing in the broader region? Does India's paranoia slash legitimate fear of Chinese invasion contribute to India's sort of control freak behavior in the region? And then there are a range of other questions linked to this, this broader theme. So I'll, I'll put them, I'll pop them together. There's a question from uh, Professor Sumit uh, Mukherjee who says, is Nepal changing its stance towards India after evidence of China? Sorry after evidence of Chinese expansionism in Nepal itself. So do, are we seeing something much more recent that's changing? There's a, there's a question from uh, 1008, from Ang Sonam Sherpa, who says, uh, thank you so much to all the speakers. I have a question to Mr. Pandey with regards to the shifts in phases in Nepal's internal politics. How would you characterize the effect of the national rise of the BJP in India? So sort of, I guess, right-wing Hindutva um, since 2014, and how does it perhaps, how has it perhaps triggered nationalist and Hindutva forces in Nepal at the same time? So this speaks to, I think, the, the point you sort of concluded with in some ways. Um, and then there's a final one uh, that I should add. Did I get everything? 948? No, that's it. So let me let me stop there and, and turn it over to the uh, to the panelists, and, uh, and and then we'll try and do another round afterwards. So I think you're muted. Sorry. Yeah. Um, yeah, definitely. I would. Uh, I agree with this person. Uh, this person who says that uh, Bhutan has not really been as agitated about the border dispute as India is. Uh, this was uh, this was true during the Doklam crisis also. Uh, but I would say that uh, you know last year. Uh, when this issue of uh, Sark 10 came up, it was not that big an issue in India itself. Uh, definitely, Modi benefited a lot with his, you know, very muscular posturing uh, from the Doklam crisis. Uh, but this Sark 10 was hardly really reported uh, in the media itself. It wasn't that big an issue. So, uh, so yeah, so I don't think it was uh, that true that that uh, that um, I, I don't think Modi really benefited from uh, from the subtech issue or tried to highlight it. That panel. Great, thank you. Yeah. Um, would any of the other panelists? I know I asked a bunch of questions, but uh, anyone would want to sort of jump in or? 
I think just on that first question is to add on a little bit, you know, I think there's an open question about um, with regard to the China Bhutan um, territorial claims, how much of it is about Bhutan and how much of it is about really India and getting better access to vulnerable positions for India by going through Bhutan. So I think it's kind of to be expected that you will see an Indian reaction um, to the extent that we saw with Doklam, where at the start of it, it was unclear uh, whether or not um, India had actually got permission from Bhutan to enter Bhutan. So it's to do to be able to get through there to the Doklam area. Um, I think that's always going to be there. Just, that's just the, the fairly limited point I want to make on that. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Uh, Shall you any any responses to the questions I've directed at you? Sure, sure. I, I think a bunch of uh, very interesting questions regarding China's uh, sort of assertiveness, how to understand China's rise as a rising power, the behavior pattern of, of Chinese foreign policy. So let me uh, uh, first have a clarification. My whole arguments in the presentation, I did not uh, say the, the, the conflict, the border problem is entirely driven by India's paranoid mindset. That, that was not my argument. My argument is that we, we, we need to go beyond this kind of like a uh, conventional military capability, balance of power to understand the issue. So nationalism, identity politics, their concerns, both countries' concerns about their status, all these contribute to the problem. So that was my original key argument, not like, like oh, it's entirely driven by Indians paranoid. So that not, was not my argument. So second, uh, I want to address the, how to understand China as a rising power is different from any other rising power, how to understand the border dispute in South Asia and China's sort of assertiveness in South China Sea. So let me first uh, emphasize that all rising powers want to expand their power and influence. By definition, that's rising power, right? So I think the key is how we understand the, uh, the different implications of rising powers growing role on the global stage and how to manage the process uh, peacefully. So I argue that a rising power potentially could have different types of assertiveness. It could have uh, expansionist or aggressive assertiveness. It could have uh, uh, defensive assertiveness. Uh, it could have constructive assertiveness. So I argue that actually in, in terms of China, I mean, China has settled most of its territory and marine time disputes with neighboring countries. I think when we talk about all oh, the big news of South China Sea, Indian China border, we, we forgot actually China has settled most border disputes peacefully with neighboring countries. That will or, already happen. But of course, there's some these remaining disputes. Why there are, there are remaining issues? Because maybe other factors more complicated. So I, I think uh, uh, to a larger extent, I, uh, suggest that maybe China's assertiveness largely because China in recent years has strengthened its capabilities to defend its claim. So it's not like China dramatically changed all these disputes with neighboring countries. So I'm not saying this is not a problem. This is still a challenge for the regional order and for, for, for China's re, uh, relationship with neighboring countries. But China has not dramatically changed all these claims. Most of the claims, it remained the same for many decades. It's just in recent years, I think China has strengthened its capabilities to and a willingness to defend those claims that generated the country, at least partially contribute uh, to, uh, to the tension. And of course, that's also partially related to China's domestic politics, so I think uh, uh, we can uh, talk a little bit uh, later if if, uh, if if we have time. So yeah, some brief comments. Please Great, thank you, Shayu. Um, uh, Shubanga, would you like to address any of the comments that were raised or questions? Yeah. You're mu muted. Okay, uh, there was one question, uh, wondering if Nepal changed its stance uh, towards India because of awareness of Chinese expansionism. Um, 
I think it, it depends on what you mean by uh, how, how do you describe Nepali change of stances and what is Chinese expansionism. I mean, if it involves, I think it's referring to Chinese kind of micromanagement of Nepali politics. Uh, but for a lot of Nepali kind of political and economic elites, uh, their interest is not just in that, but actually in the inflow of Chinese capital, for example. And you might see forms of conflict between um, you know, Nepali businesses that rely on Indian imports, for example, or Indian uh, you know, ties with, 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 uh, with Indian capital that might, um, and who are also patrons of, of Nepali political parties. And that, that, might, that might be the way the actual influence operates but i don't think uh, the and uh, what one might call chinese expansionism i don't know how how the uh, how that is being framed by by the question but that wouldn't be a new news to you know nepali political class so i i think it might have to do more with nepal india engagement in recent months than um, an awareness of chinese kind of uh, policy uh, the other question about how uh, the rise of bjp in india is affecting nepali politics it's quite interesting. I mean, if you think about uh, the Nepali Prime Minister uh, K.P. Oli's uh, his, his, his most successful PR coup was actually not releasing uh, the new uh, political map of Nepal, which shows the, the area under contention as part of Nepali territory. But it was actually saying that Ram was born in Nepal. And uh, only this week, I think, uh, the, uh, the, the small village where uh, he argued that Ram was born, they just installed a new statue of Ram and some other deities. So there is a politics of cultural nationalism, which Nepali politicians across the board have recognized is quite useful. Um, and it's worth remembering when Modi came to Nepal for the first time, I think 2014, um, he was quite popular. So there is a, you know, it's a complicated relationship on not liking Modi, uh, as it relates to Nepali politics, but maybe understanding uh, that Modi's brand of politics might uh, win favor back home. So, um, yeah. Great, thank you. Uh, so we have uh, we have not that much time, but we have. I'm going to ask another round of questions, uh, and uh, if um, uh, if I can ask, is are the panelists okay for maybe extend the session by a few minutes as we take the second round? Uh, if there's a hard stop, then we'll we will of course do a hard stop. But I hope I hope we can stay on for a few minutes past the the half hour mark. Uh, to, 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 to do one more round. So um, I'm gonna uh, start with uh, a couple of questions that actually do have to do with sort of military capacity and capability. So uh, contra what Shayu was just telling us or exhorting us to do, which is look past the military. But there are a couple of questions. The first one is from Anu Anwar. Again, if you're reading, it's at 10.06. Uh, and he asks, um, it's uh, primarily directed to, to, uh, to Frank O'Donnell, uh, could you please explain a bit further on why you think India has an advantage over China uh, in the event of a non-nuclear military confrontation? Is it only because of growing U.S.-India security ties, or is there any built inbuilt capability in India's armed forces which would offer India an edge? And there's a related question uh, from uh, Bin, Bin Duan, who says, in an era of extremely developed military weapons, an era when intercontinental missiles can reach the capitals of both sides directly, does it make sense for a country to emphasize the threat on the border? Is it to exaggerate border issues to serve domestic election politics or to overemphasize uh, the sovereignty attribute of the nation state? Or, or is there a, a real military threat? Uh, how, how do you define it? I guess this, this is an open question to everyone uh, tied to military capacity. Um, there's a, a second set of questions that I want to raise that have to do with sort of, uh, I, I guess the what, what uh, was already brought up, which is sort of the economic angle to a lot of this. Sort of the question of the belt and the road or other kinds of connections. There's a question from Yang Yang, uh, again, time stamped at 954. Um, uh, it's the second question here that, that I'm, I'm raising. They ask, is, is the border dispute between China and India also a response or extension to their comp competition regarding the Chinese-led belt and road initiative? So that's one, one sort of way to think about it. And Gopal Nadadur has a question, uh, you know, two. Uh, where he asks, for, in, for, for India's long-term relationship with its South Asian neighbors, it seems best to tone down the more heavy-handed approach of the past and to instead adopt a more nuanced approach aimed at finding mutually beneficial alignments on issues. Um, so do you think, do you think you're, uh, this, uh, uh, this is a, a way forward or not? Uh, and then uh, finally, there's a historical question, I can't, I can't help but throw this in, that speaks to military history. Uh, which is from uh, Eves uh, Tibergen. Uh, this is timestamp 1958. Uh, Tibergen, 
who is a political science professor at UBC uh, in Canada, who, who says, uh, given the huge diplomatic and economic cost of the 2020 Ladakh dispute for India, it does not appear to be the result of strategic thinking from China. Could it be the result of wolf warrior PLA commanders on the ground raising questions of central control of the military in the context of a very nationalist and ideological mood or moment uh, that makes it then hard to go against what is conceived as national interest. And of course, I think they're pointing to uh, the actions of the Kwantung, uh, Kwantung army in the 1930s, right? So the Japanese army that acted independently of, of orders from Tokyo that led to all kinds of diplomatic and military uh, problems in, in China's Northeast. Uh, so again, lo lots of very interesting questions. Please, uh, the, you know, feel free to, to to dive in any any members of the panel, and then uh, we will. Uh, and my apologies to the other questions that have come in. Uh, we will have to close at the end of this round. Uh, but thank you again for the questions. Okay, over to you if anyone wants to, to dive in. Um, I'll I'll go first. I mean, the first question is directed at me, and then I have like a, a brief point to make on the rest of them. So on the first one, why our study concluded that China has an advantage over, why India has an advantage over China in any major conventional conflict. Uh, firstly, it's due to positioning. Um, India's uh, major ground forces that are directed against China as well as air forces, the majority of them are permanently located closer to the border areas than uh, China's are comparatively. Uh, China's sit back further into Xinjiang, um, or in, into areas such as uh, Chengdu uh, under the Western Theater Command. And so it was simply that it would, it would take them longer to mobilize compared to that of India. Positioning is one. Uh, the second part, which um, I didn't mention in the initial remarks, but which are part of the report are there are training differentials. Uh, India has experience of um, uh, fighting wars, um, its, its commanders have experience of commanding these kinds of things, and uh, there is a certain advantage to combat experience which you simply can't replicate. Um, and so China, on the other hand, um, has on, on paper a very impressive looking air force, for example, one that's gradually uh, modernizing. However, it's still moving its air force training protocols away from what was previously a very, very highly scripted process where um, the everybody involved knew exactly what was going to happen in the Air Force exercise. Everybody involved would get 100% score and then you never do get promoted. And they're trying to move away from that. But in the process, uh, for example, uh, the pilots in the, at the lead of the formation are not used to being faced with truly unpredictable scenarios and challenges. And so they're the ones that are supposed to be directing the rest of the formation what to do, but they themselves are constantly radioing the control tower saying, what do I do? I don't know what to do here. That's something that the Indian pilots, for example, don't have because they just have that experience that's there. Um, so for, there's partly those, those two reasons that we made that, that kind of conclusion. Secondly, is the India-China border dispute related to the BRI dispute? I think there's a much broader India strategic competition and those are two elements of it, but I, I don't think that those are really linked. And I think one could easily happen without the other. I don't think those are linked really in either, either capital's minds. Can both sides not downplay the hostile rhetoric and aggression and uh, pursue mutual, mutually beneficial alignments? Um, I think uh, yes, they can, and they have tr they have tried to really, I think, strongly in the 2000s. But as we see, that simply is becoming decreasingly possible, um, as I as I talked about earlier on. And lastly, this is an important point because I think I've heard I've heard this mentioned before. Was the entire Ladakh uh, Chinese movement uh, into Indian Indian governed uh, Ladakh simply a lack of command and control in Beijing, and was it? enterprising or aggressive uh, PLA commanders who simply saw an initiative and went with it. Um, a, a, an event of that magnitude, an incursion of that magnitude cannot have gone forward without approval from, uh, from the highest levels in Beijing. Um, and what happened was there was a uh, regular military exercise in Tibet that was then used as a feint, uh, and, and then some PLA forces then, were then directed toward Ladakh. Even if there was some an entrepreneurial PLA commander, um, if that was the case, then China would have withdrawn very quickly upon Beijing hearing about that. 
they wouldn't have done what we saw in terms of, uh, you know, multiple instances of fatalities, uh, huge military infrastructure building, and just committing and, and, deeping, and deepening and entrenching their position there. I'll stop at that. Thank you so much. Yeah, so we, let's let's take a few more minutes and, and allow, allow the other panelists to also respond. Uh, but if, if everyone, I, if, I'd like to request everyone to be brief if possible. So, because we are, we are past time. But yeah, please go ahead. Yeah, I, I also have a few uh, reactions. First, regarding, I also wanted to emphasize the uh, uh, brief comment about the military balance. I think uh, it's true. Maybe India had, had some tactical advantage uh, uh, but it's also partially driven by the, uh, the asymmetry of tension. So as I described, Indians see China as a major threat. China does not see India as a major threat. Most of China's military planning is about uh, Taiwan contingency, marine time dispute. So I think there's a different kind of attention there. But uh, on the other hand, I don't think it's wise for policymakers to assume you have military advantage regarding a disputed issue because it's never no. I mean, it's it's never no. It's 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 exact the dangerous kind of thinking when you, when you think about it, you have military advantage. But on the other hand, all military prepare for the worst case scenario. That's their professional job. So no problem to pre to to prepare for the worst case scenario. But don't think there is a easy military solution about the border dispute between the two countries. So that's one. Second, uh, I think uh, domestic politics uh, in China definitely play a role, but overall, uh, I don't think POA make decision, even tactical decision based on the, their own calculation. It's largely because as I described, in recent years, China has strengthened its positioning regarding those dispute issues. So within China, that become kind of political correctness. In a sense, no matter it's diplomats or POA officers, they have to be more tough to be politically correct. So I, in that sense, I don't think POAs is make their DC uh, different from Xi Jinping's thinking. Uh, in contrast, they try to be uh, uh, sort of to be cor politically correct, to, be, to appear to be more tough. I think that, that's the issue. So uh, let, let me stop there. Thank you. Great, thank you. Uh, Dr. Ramachandran or, or uh, Shivanga, any, any quick comments? Yeah, please go ahead. You're, you're muted again, sorry. Um, you know, this is with regard to what role, um, you know, India's behavior as a big brother in South Asia, what role has it played in these countries uh, turning to China? I would say that India's big brother, uh, you know, its arrogant uh, approach towards its neighbors uh, that has definitely contributed to anti-India sentiment in the region. Uh, with regard to turning to China, I think it's uh, just about money. Um, uh, they are interested in uh, developing their infrastructure and China has the money. Uh, India, you know, uh, keeps saying that it's going to, uh, you know, extend similar kind of loans, but it simply lacks the big pockets, uh, the deep pockets. So um, yeah, and, and another another very significant kind of asymmetry in some ways to to, to add to to Xiaoyu's point in some ways. Um, any so I guess uh, final final thoughts from Hanga? Yeah, just one small point in continuation what what uh, Dr. Ramachandran was saying. It's uh, also I think there's a dialectical relationship between the kinds of parties that are in power in Kathmandu and I see here in Colombo, which are also the parties that pursue certain kind of uh, say development projects that do require certain kinds of uh, capital investment where it's you know so the the it's it, it's also influenced by the kinds of politics we're seeing in these countries where there's greater openness towards um, uh, these geopolitical possibilities so they're more likely to pursue uh, these projects um, and you know and this that's why they will need certain kinds of assistance um, but yeah Great. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. We have, unfortunately, we've run out of time, but we have not actually run out of questions. So this is sort of uh, the, the final asymmetry to end on, I guess, uh, and unfor another unfortunate uh, asymmetry, if you will. Uh, but I want to thank, uh, uh, you know, the audience for joining us, but thanks to, especially to our panelists today for such a, a stimulating set of comments. 
uh, and I think uh, I would like to think that this has been a somewhat distinct discussion compared to a lot of the discussions that I have been privy to over the past year at different you know different places that really do fixate on China and India and, and don't sort of consider this in larger regional and geopolitical and 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 other sort of uh, frameworks. So thank you again so much for joining us, uh, and uh, we we wish you a, a, a good rest of the evening or rest of the day wherever you are. So thank you.